Hello, and thank you for joining us for this edition of the One Young World Together Apart series. My name is Isra Chakar from the United States. I'm a proud One Young World ambassador. I'm a civil rights activist, and I'm also the senior campaign lead for the Migration and Protection Campaign at Oxfam America. It is my pleasure to be speaking with longtime One Young World counselor, Sinead Burke, who is a writer, activist, teacher, and podcast presenter for her show, <laughs> As Me with Sinead. Very impressive, and I highly recommend listening. She is an educator at her core, from teaching children about the meaning of representation to highlighting the lack of inclusivity within the fashion and design industries. Many of you will have seen Sinead at the Met Gala, on the late night show with Seth Meyers, and on the cover of British Vogue for the Forces for Change issue. Thank you, Sinead, for joining us. Before we begin, tell us where you are and how you're doing in this new normal. Well, firstly, I'm not sure this episode is going to get any better than your introduction, certainly from <laughs> my perspective. So I'm incredibly grateful. And whoever told you those wonderful things about me, firstly, they lie. But please <laughs> send them a bouquet of flowers on my behalf. I am at home in Ireland. This is my family home. And I'm surrounded by most of my siblings and my parents. And I have been here for just over a month now. When we talk about this notion of new normal, it's very abnormal for me. I'm a person who travels quite often and has the privilege and the luxury of doing so. So to be in one space has been wonderful, but also a challenge as somebody who is constantly trying to create change or constantly trying to instigate a new conversation. The world forcing me to stop and to be in one place and to not be productive despite me trying to grow plants and learn how to knit has been almost this cognitive dissonance between me, my body, and the world. So it has been good for me, I think, um, whilst also filling me with not necessarily anxiety, but definitely curiosity and questions about what the world is going to be like after this. Well, I'm so glad that you're doing well. I'm glad that your family's doing well. And we're just so grateful to have you here on here with us. Uh, my first question for you is, for those who aren't aware, what has the effect of COVID-19 been on those with disabilities? The impact of COVID-19 on the disabled community has been almost immeasurable, you know, at, at every level. My dad is a little person like me, which means he's physically disabled. And for the past couple of weeks, he has been saying this phrase almost flippantly. He says, if, if I get sick, I want to get sick now. Because if I get sick now, there might be a chance that they'll treat me. Whereas if I get sick when we're at the peak of this curve, if they have to choose between saving me or saving somebody who is less disabled, that choice will have to be made and I won't be the person who is given a benchmark. And it's, ter it's terrifying. I mean, because it's the reality. Because ableism that exists in our society is being magnified and amplified and we're not even questioning it. You know, the language of vulnerability and saying people who are vulnerable or who have underlying conditions we are othering them further, both in our news reports, and we're almost not surprised when their deaths are announced. It's almost, well, what did we or they expect? And we have lost the humanity that is tied to it. I didn't choose to be disabled. And mm. yet this disease is affecting people in such gargantuan ways. And that's probably the most, one of the most drastic ways that, you know, as this progresses in all of the countries, what we will see is disabled people dying because they weren't given the option of treatment, because they weren't considered enough. They were too hard work, whereas it would have been better to heal somebody who was healthy to live a better life, whatever that may mean afterwards. Mm -hmm. It is a statement to say that disabled lives are worthless. Mm -hmm. And that is horrifying. And how will we change that rhetoric and that narrative as we move forward. I do also think that there's been a lot of learning. I think disabled people in terms of employment and in terms of workforce, since time immemorial have asked companies and corporates to be more flexible. Mm -hmm. In terms of the ability to work from home, many offices and buildings are inaccessible. The bathrooms in those buildings are inaccessible. And disabled people who are qualified and capable and have wonderful insights to share with corporations have asked about being able to be employees and working from home. And the corporate sector in many ways have been ignorant to this and have said it's not possible. When what we're realizing right now is it is. 
And I think it is repeating the cycle for the disabled community of seeing that their accommodations are not necessary until it's necessary for all. And then we find ways in which to design it. But as somebody who is embedded in the principles of inclusive design, it proves the theory that if we design for disabled people, there is benefits for everybody. And I am hopeful that in this new world, whatever it may be, that those principles are remembered. And we don't just go back to the way in which we were, to mm -hmm. underlining the exclusion that we have continued to face, but actually to say, okay, here's a way in which we can be flexible, not just for the disabled community, but for parents, for people who are carers of older or sick relatives. And actually that greater flexibility will benefit us all. I also think that there has been a greater awareness of disabled voices. I think with more people being at home and perhaps being online and being able to subscribe to content or scrolling through social media timelines, disabled voices have been more vocal. I think there is still an amplification that needs to occur to a greater extent. But I think there's been huge challenges from the disabled community, both done to us and about us. And I think one of the greatest challenges going forward is that in terms of creating solutions, be it vaccinations, be it policies, disabled people are still not being included within mm -hmm. the legislative process. So we're actually not going to amend any of the lack of inclusion that we have historically and even now are still currently experiencing because we are not gaining that insight in the rooms in which powerful decisions are being made. But yeah. I'm hopeful it can change. You know, what you shared was so powerful because I think, like you said, people forget that there are vulnerable populations that in times like a pandemic are impacted even deeper. And, you know, the work that I do and a lot of other organizations are doing around refugees, around asylum seekers, around migrants who are in camps and outside of camps um, really proves that, again, you're disenfranchised in a lot of ways and you don't get access to things. So definitely hearing about the disabled community and just their experience is really important and people realizing that this affects them on a greater level than the typical average person um, who is able-bodied and very priv privileged in that way. So thank you for that. And I'm so sorry mm -hmm. that your family's having those conversations. I can't imagine what that feels like, but I think that's a conversation many people who are vulnerable are having right now if they were to get sick. So thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, Sinead, are governments doing enough to cater to them? If not, what can be done to create a more inclusive response to COVID-19? I think you hinted a little bit on this in your earlier question, but any specific points you can make about that? I think there needs to be a greater understanding of the holistic impacts of this. I think mm -hmm. at the minute what we're attempting to do is solve the immediate crisis, and um, whether that is flattening a curve and lowering numbers. But what we're seeing is, and at points there have been reflective thinking and reflective actions based on say perhaps previous ableist legislation so in the uk there is a rule that says you may only exercise once a day but actually if you're disabled you may need to leave your home more than once a day or you may need to go at frequent times because the level of exercise that you can obtain during one outing is not enough in terms of your daily requirements so you may have to leave your house for three ten minutes instead of 30 minutes and that rule has now been amended to be more inclusive. But I think there needs to be a broad awareness. I think the charitable organizations are the organizations that best represent these voices need greater funding. I think we are at risk of so many of these organizations collapsing. If we are seeing large corporates saying that they need bailouts, then the organizations that are representing these communities will undoubtedly need them too. And what happens if they all fold and we don't get to hear those voices and they don't even get raised in ways in which they historically were? I think that the inclusion of disabled people within all legislative processes is something that should be embedded around the world immediately. I think the understanding of the nuances, that the challenges that don't just face us now, but will in the future. And I think the lack of listening to those people and providing spaces is going to cause long-term impacts. I also think in terms of government, you know, so much of what we're talking about now is cocooning, is isolation and ensuring that people maybe go out to the grocery store, whatever it is. But I actually don't think there has been much rhetoric about kind of mental health and that fitting within the category of dis disability too, because mm -hmm. whether it is older people, you know, older people, as you age, you understand that your independence is becoming lessened. And what we have literally told elderly people of the world is your independence doesn't matter. The only thing that matters right now is that A, you don't get sick, but actually more importantly, that you don't infect anybody else. So you need to stay in one place on your own. Don't interact with anybody else. And in terms of that vulnerability that you're feeling, you just mm -hmm. have to embrace it. 
And that is so unfair. And I understand the necessity of it, but the trauma that we are administering to people will have such long lasting effects. And I also think that, you know, from a disability perspective, mm -hmm. there is a lack of insight from government of the impact of that isolation, that so many disabled people, whether it is if they have carers, if they need additional support, that holistic legislation that is needed. But I think the final thing is, you know, there's a piece in the New York Times today that talks about the impact of COVID-19 in homes for the disabled. And mm -hmm. what they mean by that is care homes. And what we have seen in Ireland and in many other countries is that clusters of this disease is impacting nursing homes, care homes, so much more than anything else. Because I think initially the procedures that were put in place, they were slow to do so, which meant that the impact or the possibility of those people being infected and the proximity of which they are to one another and to their carers has meant that just an enormous number of people have died. We yeah. are vulnerable. And why didn't we think of these people earlier? Yeah. Why didn't we have an insight or understanding? And that's not to place blame. I think so many governments were trying to create policies to limit the loss of life from such early setting. But for me, as a disability advocate, it underlines the fact that so often minority groups are just mm -hmm. not considered. Yeah, and well, that leads to the next question. I, some people are calling COVID-19 the great equalizer. What do you think about that? Do you think that it is? I think the reason why that motif is kind of circulating is because we're seeing people like Idris Elba, or we're seeing mm -hmm. members of senior governments becoming infected. And mm -hmm. in many ways, it's probably quite classes because as a society, when people get sick, we're used to it being poor people. And right. now we're horrified that right. people with abundance and wealth could also get sick. And my goodness, what an equalizer. Yeah. But actually, those people will more than likely have healthcare and mm -hmm. will remedy themselves with the greatest of supports and access and resources. So in many ways, yes, it is affecting people at both ends of the tiers of equality and class but actually the people who's going to have the longest greater term impact on is poorer people is working class people is people working in key roles be it in a grocery store be it as a nurse there yeah. are so many ways in which this disease is still going to affect those with the least amount of privilege in our society whether it is immigrants who are coming into the country who are living in close proximity to one another or whether cultural cues issue for those kinds of things also mm -hmm. I think it is a mistake to say that this is an equalizer I think it's true that it's affecting people of different sources of wealth or lack thereof but I think it is doing a disservice to the people who are hurting most and who will continue to do so by saying this is affecting everybody there is a greater yeah. chance that we'll all get sick but there is an increased unlikelihood that specific sections of the population will get better. 100%, and I agree with you that the disease isn't discriminate. Obviously, as you've seen, whoever you are, wherever position you sit in society, what race you are, what religion you are, it doesn't matter, it doesn't discriminate, but you are 100% correct that no matter what, the experience won't be equal across and people will not have the same experience with this. And you know, especially here in the US, we have a huge number of people uninsured, um, Medicare and medical, you know, medical care in general is just not, it's not free. So it's really disenfranchised people even more, vulnerable people who are scared to go to a hospital because they can't afford, you know, $3,000 upwards bill. So, um, and the lack of testing as well over here, the lack of access to testing. So you're completely right, you know, it's interesting to see people who sit on, you know, higher economic status and are able to receive multiple tests if they wanted it, whereas people who are clearly exhibiting a lot of symptoms aren't, aren't able to. Um, but thank you for sharing that. I think that's very important. This pandemic has inspired people to volunteer in record numbers, but it has also intensified some people's individualism and sort of looking out for themselves. How can we encourage the first type of behavior and discourage the second? I think we all have a role in this. I think the point that you just raised is incredibly important. I think never more has it been underlined the fact that democracy is essential that in these moments in which we could have never predicted, what we're realizing is important is 
access to a clean and safe environment in order to exercise and gain oxygen for our mental health. Grocery stores, those who are, you know, lower paid laborers, we're realizing actually the importance of them. What we don't need is investment bankers to survive a pandemic most of the time. What we need yeah. is the person in the grocery store. What we need is the teacher to be able to create lessons and curriculum. What we need is the nurse. And I think some, some of the key things that we can do right now is not just celebrate these people for the risks that they are taking and the sacrifices that they are making to themselves and their families in this moment, but afterwards. You know, it's almost seasonal that one of these professions have to go on strike because they're being underpaid. And we are so flippant oftentimes in those moments. And I think we should further the support that we're giving now. Clapping for the NHS and the HSE workers is so important to keep that morale, but that shouldn't be just in times of crisis. I think there's always going to be people who find ways to exploit the crisis. Oh, definitely, I agree. I don't think we should give them a microphone. I think if they're choosing to do those things and be those people, then what they thrive on most is attention. And the people who I would rather give my attention to are those who are sitting on Instagram, reading a children's book to their audience so that parents at home can have five minutes to brush their teeth, to shower, or whatever it is that they may need to do in that moment of solace. And there are so many ways in which you can make a difference, which sounds trite. And whether that's figuring out how to teach people how to make cotton masks, and even though they're not surgical, but they may be of use to the ordinary person at home, or if it's giving clear and factual information or sharing it rather than sharing fake news or using WhatsApp groups to create fear mongering, yeah. but actually making decisions to participate as a citizen and think beyond yourself and ask questions like, what do I stand for? What is my purpose within this moment? How can I be useful? And not thinking about oneself. But I think it's hard. I think we live in a capitalist society where constantly the emphasis is placed on economy and placed on money and is placed on your productivity equating to your value as a person. And I think in this moment, what we're realizing is that's not true. Mm -hmm. And actually how we should value one another, how we should quantify the metric of society is based on that collectivism and how we understand that this is affecting people in different gradients and do to equalize that. Unfortunately, Sinead, we're just out of time, but if you could leave the One Young World community with a key action to take away, what would it be? I know easier said than done to choose just one. We are living in a time in which we are about to enter into a new world. The new world is scary. Economists are predicting enormous change that we have never seen in our lifetime. Up until now, we have amassed enormous progress in the fight for diversity and inclusion. There is still so much work to do, but progress has been made. Do not allow this new world to say that it is not cost effective to maintain this progress and to accelerate it further. We, as a society, deserve more than that. Continue to fight for the issues that we were fighting for before. This moment hasn't stopped Islamophobia, xenophobia, ableism from existing. It's magnified them further. So whatever participant you are in this new world, fight for everything we stood for before with increased vigor and delight and humor. Thank you so much, Sinead. Let's please thank give you. a huge thank you to Sinead for her time. I hope you and your family stay safe and take thank it you. well. And please make sure to like, comment, and share this session. Thank you all for watching, One Young World family, and take care. And Israel, thank you. You were. You're so sweet. You're my hero. Ah, look who's talking. <laughs>